everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Samantha and this is Trans IRL. It's hard to believe, but this is actually the 35th episode of the show. As always, we're always looking for great guests to share their stories for our audience. So if you know of any trans individuals or trans allies who are doing amazing things for or with the transgender community, please comment their names on this video or send us a message on Instagram. Over in the Trans IRL control room, Stephen is celebrating an anniversary this week. Stephen, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, one year of uh, the injections. Uh, I was on, uh, of course, the, the pills. And, of course, talking a little inside baseball here, but uh, the levels just weren't working for me for the first six months. So uh, we went into overdrive, and on August 7th, 2019, um, I switched to injections. And so it's my, I think they call it B.I. HRT day uh, for uh, right. for those for those on the uh, <laughs> the uh, Instagram lingo and uh, so this is uh, it's uh, so we're so we're all and uh, joining the party here with everybody tonight is uh, and we get to all celebrate together. That's it. And you posted a really great timeline on your Instagram page too. So if you're not already following Stephen on Instagram, go check it out. It's really uh, it's amazing, isn't it? It's 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 magic what HRT can do. There you go. You got your link right there. Exactly. And somebody who's not, you know, who's older too, you know, uh, I, I've said on the show, I'm 49. And, uh, you know, that's, it, that's, as I've learned from the show, it's not too late to, to do this stuff and, and have uh, meaningful uh, effects for you. I still have no idea how you're actually 49 years old. I still think you're not telling the truth, but you look amazing. Congrats on your anniversary. And uh, for everyone in the chat, I see a lot of congrats going on out there too. Um, yeah, as always, Steve will be monitoring the live chat. So if you do have any questions for tonight's guest, please make sure to add them there. But right now, let's go ahead and get to this week's guest. Our guest is a model and activist. He's appeared on the runway in New York City and has made international news for his work advocating for the rights of those with disabilities and those who are transgender. He publicly shares his journey through his Instagram page, The Disabled Hippie, where his fashion and style are just as inspiring as his work supporting the trans and disabled communities. So with that, I would like to welcome Julian Gavino to the show. Welcome, Julian. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, no, I you know, have just been amazed at your reach, you know, not only within the trans community, but beyond the trans community through your modeling and, and advocacy work. And, um, you, you know, I, I think the first time I saw you on stage was when you did work with Tomboy X, right? Yeah, yeah, that was one of my first big uh, yeah. fashion shows. Yeah. And that, that blew up, that was everywhere, and was just so incredible to see uh, not only a, a trans individual, but a disabled individual um, out there on the stage and, and just getting the recognition that so desperately needed um, out there to, to the rest of the world. Yeah, that was a but huge I, I moment in my life for sure. Absolutely. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I'm, I'm, I do that often. <laughs> but to start, I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, what your childhood was like, and also when you first realized that your identity was more complicated than what was assigned at birth. Yeah, um, so I grew up in Florida. Um, I'm on, I'm in like the Sarasota area. Um, so it's a really beachy kind of small, uh, very conservative area. So where I grew up, there's not really anybody like me. Um, it's a lot of older people. Uh, it's not, not a big younger scene and not a big queer scene at all. Um, I, I, it took me a while, you know, to... I think the first time I remember hearing about a trans person was like Dr. Phil. And of course it was like a really offensive... Um, you know, episode. And I kind of remember seeing it and being like, this, I feel something about this. Um, and I asked my mom and, and she was like, yeah, that, that happens sometimes. And I was just like, okay. And, uh, then I kind of internalized that. Um, but I did come out really young. I was about 14. Uh, so I've been out for almost 11 years now, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah, that is quite a while. Um, you know, it's so funny you bring up Dr. Phil. I think so many of us had experiences early before we even understood what we were feeling where the first time we were exposed to trans individuals was through television and not usually in very good 
situations either, right? On talk shows, daytime talk shows. And I remember being a kid as well. And those episodes would come on. Um, and you'd, I'd be like, kind of like watching out of the corner of my eye, like, yeah, mm-hmm. okay, this isn't interesting, but it's all I can think about. Um, so you came up fairly young as a teenager. What was that like coming out at that age, um, especially your, your family's reaction? How did they react to that news? Uh, well, I don't want to like sound cliche, but I had always felt, you know, like off or something. Um, I just couldn't articulate it. Uh, for me, it really started to form when I started dating. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but I, I thought I loved boys or like was, you know, in love with them. But over time, like dating them, I realized it was more of an infatuation about like being them. Like I was realizing, actually, I want to be this, I want this like switched around. Um, it's hard to articulate, but I thought back to like early kind of stuff I saw like the Dr. Phil stuff or other things and I started to do my own research and I was like wow this is how I feel and I'm pretty scared about it um so I did keep it to myself for a while uh but I got into a lot of really bad stuff at at some point in my teenage years uh because of trying to suppress it I started to you know act out and I had substance abuse issues for quite a while so there came kind of a tipping point where I was like, I can't uh, deny it like any longer. I can't just like pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and the first person I told uh, was my grandma and she was, uh, well, the first adult I told like friends and um, a partner at the time. Uh, my grandma was really surprisingly okay with it. Um, and I was like, okay, I have to tell my mom. So I told my mom next, and she wasn't okay with it. And then, you know, so telling my mom started this kind of downhill spiral with, with my family for probably a good seven years. Like, I want to say it's only the past maybe two or three years that my family has finally kind of... They don't, like, love it, but they they don't hate it. They're just kind of, like okay, whatever. They've realized that I'm living my life the way I'm living it now. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing to talk about. It's not really talked about a lot on here either. A lot of people I have on, it's kind of one side or the other, right? Where either their Mm -hmm. parents or family are entirely supportive or their parents and family never want to talk to them again. Um, But there's a lot of people who fall in between those two sides where you know, you're, you're working with them, you're trying to improve um, that relationship, you're, you're trying to help them understand that this isn't just a whim or um, a phase, that this is who you actually are. And I'm glad that you can articulate that and share your experiences there because, you know, seven years is a long time to put into, uh, put into a family in, in trying to get them to come around and understand, you know, who you are and accept who you are. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, in my opinion, that's, that's awesome that you were able to fight that long and, and not give up or have your family give up either. You know, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to note that I did give up a couple times. Um, we, <laughs> we had some times where we didn't speak. Um, maybe, uh, I think a total of like two years, but it was split up into like two different years. Um, But there were some times where I did have to kind of let it go and live my own life. But I think that that in the end was very beneficial for us to have that that time away of realizing like, okay, no, we actually do want to be in each other's lives. But this is this is how it has to be Um, just because I wouldn't budge with my parents and my parents are. um, They're very, very Italian and they're very traditional. Uh, My whole family is so it's. Uh, there's a certain expectation, I suppose, that goes along with uh, some of those traditions. But you touched on something important there, too, and that is that if the communication is not going well, or if you're in a situation where you're not making progress, it's okay to take a step back. You you don't have to subject yourself to mental torture, um, 24 7 while you're while you're working through this and um, since mental health is such an important part of successfully navigating through transition and coming out 
um, yeah, it's absolutely essential to remember, yeah, you can take that step back if needed. You don't have to put yourself in a position where you're not being respected or, or seen for, for who you are. So, um, no, thank you for sharing that portion of your journey. And, and you know, it's, it's great to hear that things are better now, but it was a lot of work to get there. Yeah, uh, for a long time I tried to uh, force them to go to therapy with me, and my mom did for a while. Um, my dad was not open to it, um, but by kind of stepping back and not forcing it, it allowed them to do that on their own time. And then when I did come back into their lives, uh, they told me they had been going to um, group meetings with uh, parents of, of trans individuals. So they kind of did it on their own, which... Um, you know, I'm not trying to say that that's, you know, what will happen every time to everyone. That's obviously a unique situation. Um, and I don't think my parents are uh, about to go to a pride parade, like, anytime soon either. But they're, they're like, they're like, it, it exists. Okay. <laughs> they're like, okay. And, you know, they respect my pronouns and my name. And that's important. No, I think that's wonderful progress. And I mean, ultimately, any relationship, right, especially with family is a is a compromise, right? What are you willing to accept? What are they willing to accept? And it sounds like overall, it's a good place. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, as I get older, um, we both understand each other more. Um, yeah. All right. Something I do want to talk about as well, uh, something that affects a lot of trans individuals is our own take on what it means to be us. You know, there's a lot of societal pressures out there to conform to the binary quote unquote expectations of what it means to be a man or a woman. And yeah. in your case, I'm wondering, you know, did you feel those pressures and, and how did you handle them? And how long did it take you to feel comfortable in your own skin? Um. Well, um, yeah, definitely. Like, I think because kind of going back to what I said about being raised traditionally, um, it was kind of the expectation in my family, um, you know, that women are to kind of like have children and, uh, I don't know, be, be a housewife and, you know, like learning how to cook and all of these things. And that was kind of the expectation of me and uh, my family, you know, was religious. So going to church and, you know, being a good person or whatever and being proper and like feminine and girly. Um, and obviously that's not how I felt. Um, I didn't feel that way in a lot of ways, not, not in a gender way, but also not in a career way either. It was also expected of me to go a traditional career route. Um, but I've always been a very creative person and, you know, that was always suppressed in me, like as a young person, um, and kind of like, uh, like don't, don't do that cause it doesn't make money or don't do that. Cause you know, you need to go to college, you need to do this, that. Um, and then when I eventually decided to start transitioning, um, I had a partner at the time that, uh, I was with for a, a great, the greater part of my transition um, up until very recently. And that partner also had certain expectations of me in a masculine sense. So I've kind of dealt with it from both sides. Um, and then it's interesting too, because my family also, when I started transitioning, had all these masculine expectation, expectations for me as well. Um, but as over time, I realized I kind of want to fall somewhere in between. Like I do identify as a male, but I like to express myself in such and such ways. Um, and it's only very recently that I've finally come, I don't want to say come to terms because I still deal with it on a daily basis, but I finally got into a good place of expressing myself exactly the way that, that I want to and not listening to how everybody else wants me to appear. I think that's really, you know, important to share that journey as well. There, 
is an expectation, right? When you tell somebody, okay, you're transitioning, you know, you're, you're now going to be going by he, him pronouns. People, you know, immediately picture one side of the, the gender binary spectrum. And I know uh, for a lot of trans feminine individuals, it's, it's the same thing where it's like, okay, well, um, you know, there's an expectation. You dress a certain way, you talk a certain way. Um, it's funny because sometimes those pressures come from um, outside of the trans community. Sometimes those pressures come from within the trans community too to conform. Like there's some sort of an expectation that you have to look or behave a certain way or else you're not going to be accepted for who you are. And I think that's something really hard to, to break down. And especially in the moment, you know, I, I know a lot of people who, when they first start transitioning, they feel like they have to, this is how I have to dress, or this is how I have to be. And they have to go through that experience and it takes time to understand, well, maybe, you know, if I'm a trans feminine individual, maybe I'm not somebody who wears dresses every day. Maybe I'm someone who yeah. wears basketball shorts and tank tops and I'm okay with that. Um, it's interesting how even though we're in a position where we're open and aware of our identities, we'll still have a tendency to put ourselves into boxes. Maybe it's just cultural norms and growing up in that environment, but you sort of have to undo that damage as you explore your identity and your, your own expression of self. Yeah, I thought, you know, it is common. I, I get a lot of uh, messages or, or emails from other trans, uh, specifically like trans masculine individuals who are like, I thought I had to be like hyper masculine or blend in with, with the guys and you know, all this stuff. And I thought that too. And I tried so hard to, uh, kind of like, how do I explain it? Um, like mimic guys, like, I don't know, like, especially in conversations like I try to I don't know blend in or whatever and I just could never do it there would always be something it was like they would I don't know um kind of like catch on to to where it's hard to explain but they don't they don't necessarily talk to me like I'm a girl but they don't talk to me like other guys either it's sort of this weird like in between thing and uh other people have noticed it too that I brought it up to like friends or partners um and it was frustrating like I tried so hard to do that and I was just like why am I doing this this is dumb like this is not me I don't know why like I feel the need to try to do that or to like talk a certain way like I don't there aren't like rules to it but I I don't know you think that there are I guess when you sometimes when you start transitioning yeah, it's, it's something you really have to look at, especially as you get further into your transition. And you, you can feel it, right? You can feel the frustration, like, why am I even doing this? I don't even yeah. understand why this is important to me. Um, but I think that's something that comes with time. And it's one of those things that we missed out on, you know? If we had the opportunity to transition at a younger age, perhaps, you know, those teenage years where you could figure out, you know, who you are and what you needed to uh, express who you are, we, we have to figure those out now, you know, something that we didn't have to ask ourselves before. Yeah, yeah. And I also wanted to say, I thought it was interesting you said, um, you can hear that sometimes from the trans community because when I first started to uh, kind of appear a little bit more femme on my Instagram, because um, like I said, it's only been recently, uh, I got a lot of comments and a lot of messages from uh, the trans community or queer community that were like, are you non-binary now? Are you going to go by they, them? And some people were kind of pressuring me to do it. Like, it seemed like they were kind of bullying me into uh, coming out as non-binary. And I, I actually had to make a post about it and being like, no, I'm not. And that's, that's not how I feel. And please, you know, stop asking me that because it's not, I don't need to, you know, come out as non-binary just because I've changed my appearance a little bit. You know, it was, it was kind of silly. Um, but it does happen. Definitely. No, I appreciate you sharing that conversation. I think it's an important one. It's one that doesn't come up a lot, you know, for some reason it gets glossed over, but it's something that really a lot of people experience. And especially in, in mainstream, um, I don't want to say mainstream, but 
if you look on social media, for example, you know, the people who usually get the attention are the people that focus on one side or the other of, of uh, binary expression. So it's, it's sort of, it, it leaves a lot out, you know. There's a lot missing in how trans people are portrayed in social media and in, and in regular media for that matter, on TV and in movies. Um, and I think it's just so important that we not only are aware of it, but we accept who we are and we accept that not everyone has to fit into a certain mold to be valid and, and accepted. Yeah, and I also think it's just, um... I don't know, it's, it's ridiculous almost to, and kind of funny if you think about it, like reducing people to how they look or like what Absolutely. they wear. It's, it's very superficial um, and it's not, uh, not at all important. <laughs> well, while you were working through your own transition, you were also working through other health concerns. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to share what you feel comfortable sharing about your your journey there yeah um so i haven't been disabled my whole life but i've been chronically ill my entire life um i was born with the condition that i have it's called ehlers danlos syndrome um so it is a genetic connective tissue disorder um and since you have connective tissue uh, basically everywhere, um, it, it causes problems in most areas of the body, or at least it can. Um, in my case, it does affect a lot of areas of my body. Um, and it's unfortunately affected me in a very neurological way. Um, so that is why uh, oftentimes you'll see me in a wheelchair. I use a wheelchair a good majority of the time I can still uh you know ambulate around um with other mobility devices but not for too long um but my health has been a journey and i went through um a good part of that during my transition um because i've only been physically disabled for like the past six or seven years um so it was really hard to deal with the fact that my health started to get worse like right around the time that I was transitioning and then not long after I was taking hormones because I had all of these like and going back remember this was in my kind of like hyper masculine phase I had all these ideas and plans to like work out or like get super buff and like <laughs> you know I just had this vision of like what I would look like and um I wasn't able to work out the way that I had planned. Um, and a lot of my conditions affect the way that I absorb the testosterone. Um, not only just because of what they are, but they've also given me a lot of reproductive issues as well. Um, so even though I'm on testosterone, I still have a lot of female like hormones in my body that are way too high. Uh, so my transition hasn't gone like the traditional uh, transition, which it's been hard to deal with. Okay, you know, I still am going to have like my voice isn't as deep as I would like it to be. I still have hips and kind of like a butt and like, <laughs> um, yeah, I had to deal with that and just kind of embrace it and accept it. And I think I've done pretty well at this point, but especially when I was younger, it was not easy to, I don't know, I hated the fact that I still had hips and uh, my voice was like a little higher, so. Well, you touched on something really important there and that's self-acceptance. And for a lot of trans individuals, you know, we're not always able to change everything about us or not everything that we're, we're able to even adjust as part of transition is in our control. And there are things that I know in my case, I wish I could change, but aren't available, uh, whether it's financially or just because of my age when I started transitioning. Um, and it's, it's hard, um, especially as you're going through transition and you, you see other people and their experiences and what they're uh, doing with their own transition. You say, well, I wish, you know, why, why is that not happening for me? Um, but it's, it's something we all have to work through in our own way. Uh, you know, in your case, 
you know, amplified by your by your um, condition there. But for anyone in transition, we have to sort of get to a point where we eventually address the things we can't change as part of our transition. And in a way, there's you know almost a period of mourning about it. But at the same time, there's also something extremely validating and empowering about accepting that I'm not defined by the things I can't change about myself. You know, this is my body. This is what I can do. This is where I'm at. Um, this certain aspect doesn't define who I am. I'm still who I am. You're still who you are. And, and you have to sort of own it after a while, right? Or at least I, I think the healthiest thing is to get to a point where you can own it and, and feel validated in that, yeah, this is me. And I'm going to do the best I can with the time I have here. Yeah, and I think um, letting go of the, those kind of hyper-masculine thoughts and then getting back into embracing my, my best feminine self, um, I think all of that helped. And then uh, modeling has helped too, like taking pictures of, of myself and um, feeling good about myself and seeing other people also not only enjoy the photos, but people relating to it, um, either because maybe they see a reflection of them or they, they relate to some of the issues I've had. All of that has helped me to embrace it, you know, and I, I did have a mourning period, as you said, of course, but uh, I've done that with a lot of stuff in my life and I, I've transitioned in a lot of ways, like not just, you know, uh, literally like the way we're talking about, but with just... I've had a lot of really crazy things happen in my life. Um, so I've gotten good at kind of mourning it, accepting it, and then being like, okay, I've, I've cried about it, now I'm going to pick myself back up and move on because it's kind of what I've always had to do, honestly. Yeah. Transition is so much more convoluted and complicated than just changing a name or a pronoun, right? I mean, those are important things, obviously, but... There is so much more we have to accept in ourselves and understand about ourselves. And one of the most beautiful things I feel about transition is that we have this amazing opportunity to really look at ourselves um, at, at such a deep level. And it's it's a, it, it's a hard journey. It's not easy to go through that and, and build that self-acceptance and understanding. But if you take the time, if you do the work, it can be a really, truly freeing experience. And I think it's, it's nothing that happens quickly you know i feel like you know physical changes can happen pretty quick on hormones if you are someone who goes on hormones but the other stuff comes over time and even for me and i'm not as far in my transition as you are but i'm gosh almost four years in and i still feel like i'm evolving um in my own identity and and as who i am but i guess that's part of the human condition too right like no one should ever just never evaluate who they are in life we should always be looking at how can we be our, our best self uh, yeah and i think that's um continuous like i think we're always going to be evolving in some way at least uh but i feel that too like i said it took me a while to get to this place that i am in now um like i said almost 11 years and i another part of that probably has to do with the fact that some of that was in like my formative years as well. And I'm coming up on 25 years old now. So that's, you know, right around when you're uh, supposedly your identity is supposed to solidify more in your brain. <laughs> so, um, but I feel it. I, I feel like I'm, I'm close to that. So. Yeah. I think the important thing is that we are just always aware of it and, and always working through it, right? You, you're aware of it. And if you ever have those bad days, you continue to try your best to improve. It's a constant thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the page I started has helped that a lot because it, it was something I originally started as a, a diary, like just kind of putting my thoughts out there it was like I feel alone and I don't feel like anybody I can't relate to anybody I was like really sick um in college I had taken quite a few breaks in college and I was like I'm just gonna write about this and uh I was surprised that lots of other there were lots of other people like me I 
you know, like I said, I grew up in an area where that's not a thing. Um, you know, I only knew one other trans person in my immediate area. Um, and that was a person that lived very uh, stealth, as we say, like very, you know, undetected. And most people did not know um, this person had transitioned. So uh, I, I was pretty alone. I didn't really have a lot to go off of. The internet community I've made has, uh, you know, made a world of a difference. So one thing I did want to ask too, you mentioned in your local community, you didn't have a lot of trans individuals that you knew. How long into your transition was it before you ran into anyone else who was not only sharing publicly that they were trans, but they were also working through being disabled? Um, so I, you know, I had a lot of, um, had a bullying issue at my high school. So I did have to switch high schools a couple of times. Um, had a really rough time in school uh, and then I went to an art school which was like a much more accepting space um, a, a bit of you know a bigger like queer community and like I said I did meet another trans person but not many people knew that this person was trans um, he had transitioned like at a very young age like very very young um, but he wasn't disabled, but that was the first kind of experience I had. And he was a pretty vital part of my life for uh, like around the end of high school. Um, I didn't meet a disabled trans person until uh, I started on Instagram. It's only been within the past couple years, honestly. Um, and even now, like I don't, I still don't know that many trans people like in this area I'm in in Florida. When I go to New York and you know, I go to, go to Philly, you know, I know uh, copious amounts of trans people um, and, and disabled both, um, but still not here. So <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit more uh, visibility and the visibility that yeah. you've made on your Instagram page, uh, both as a, as a trans person, as somebody who is disabled, what makes, disability visibility just as important as trans visibility? Well, um, tran or, uh, dis the disability community is very behind. Um, we just had, you might have saw it uh, on Instagram, but we just had the anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, not that long ago. It was the end of July. Um, it's only 30 years old. So that's crazy to think about. Um, we're very, very behind. It's only had updates to it maybe around two times. Um, I'll have to put it back in my bio or um, send it to you, but I wrote an article about this. And um, I think it's really important to talk about because when you think about the LGBTQIA plus community uh, for, for Pride Month, like we get this, you know, big big outreach right and it's kind of uh global almost it, 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 like it's everywhere um gets a lot of backing from uh, companies and whether or not that's also sort of problematic but that's another conversation but you know we get lots of support um we don't see that kind of coverage with disability support like i only just found out disability pride month was the month of July, like last year. Um, and then this year was kind of like, I saw people celebrating it a little bit more. Uh, you know, we only just had a flag made kind of, um, it wasn't even officially either. So we're kind of a lot of the times an afterthought in conversations. Um, you'll notice it with little things too, even like even if it's just like a ramp, like someone will be like, oh yeah, we put a ramp here and it's like a, a cardboard that's like super steep. <laughs> so I don't know. It's just, we need more uh, representation and we need more marginalized communities to include us and bring us into conversations because it just doesn't happen, happen at the level that it should. Yeah, I saw the article you, you wrote there for Subvert Magazine, and it was really, I thought it was a really great breakdown, especially for someone like myself who didn't necessarily 
know some of the issues that you're facing in the disability community, um, I mean, there's there's still a lot of work to do, right? And I think there's work on both sides. There's work in the trans community. There's there's work uh, for the disability community or the disabled community. Um, I mean, in your opinion, where do we need to focus the most work, or is it even possible to quantify, you know, which community needs more support? Um, I agree with what you said. Like in they all need work, right? Like it's, I don't think the work will ever be done. Um, Cause we're always evolving. Like we just said, like, even as a society, we're always changing things. So when we change things and we move forward, we always have to include everybody. Um, you know, no matter who that person is, we gotta, we gotta move with them. Um, and I think this part got cut out of the article, but there's still a lot of very simple issues that aren't resolved for disabled people. Um, as a life coach, I see uh, all my clients are trans and disabled, either one or the other or they're both. Um, so I see, I see these people all the time, and it's so common, um, not now because no one's in school, but when people were in school, um, I'd have a client who... Uh, couldn't go to a class because, I don't know, a ramp wasn't working or there wasn't a ramp or the elevator wasn't working or, you know, like their, their literal place of education isn't accessible. Um, you know, and I had this one client who fought with the school for years and it was just uh, this big mess. So it comes down to really simple things like that, like just not even being able to leave your house um, or like grocery shop. People don't realize how difficult grocery shopping is. Um, like if I go to the store, I can't push a cart. Um, sometimes that like I'll go in a store and they're just like, we don't have baskets today. And I'm like, okay, am I just going to throw everything on my lap? I don't, I don't, you know, and you can ask for help from the employees, like they'll go shopping with you. Um, but it's awkward. I don't want to, it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me feel rushed and pressured. And uh, there's a lot of really weird kind of little things that people don't think about that still, I don't know, the world just isn't built for us. It's built for able-bodied people. Um, and it hasn't fully adapted yet. Yeah, there's still so much more work to do. Uh, one question I have for you is for the trans community in general, how can people in the trans community make sure that we're, we're doing the right work to be more inclusive of those who are disabled? Yeah, um, well, I think it starts with uh, simple things like, you know, sharing, uh, sharing stuff that you see on Instagram, kind of going out and following disabled people, uh, you know, reading, reading books, watching documentaries. Um, Crip Camp is a great documentary on Netflix. Um, I, it should still be on there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, reading, doing, you know, learning all this stuff. Cause the, the issue is that, um, and I talked about this in a, in a specific interview about the ADA. I did this for in the know. Um, they were like, what's the main problem? And I was like, well, education. Like, there's a complete and utter lack of education. Uh, it's like the ADA exists, but people don't really know why they have to follow it. They're just like, we have to be ADA compliant, but it's very vague. They don't really know what it means. Um, they don't see how many people it affects. Uh, I mean, I didn't learn about the ADA until, like, college, and most people don't. Um, until college or like a job or sometimes they never do it's not something we talk about you know in schools um when you go out in the world and you talk to able-bodied people uh they're still focused on like very small conversations like you know they'll still ask stuff like what's wrong with you or you know why can't i pet the service dog and people in the disability community are years and years and years and years ahead of those conversations like we're talking about deep internalized uh, ableism sort of stuff at this point so there's such a disconnect between those two conversations that 
in my opinion, people should know at this point. Like, it's very, to us, it's like very simple stuff, but they don't learn it. Like, it's not taught to anybody. Nobody knows why these things. I think this is probably a good opportunity to, to talk a little bit just about your page on Instagram where people can follow you and learn more about your journey and your experiences as well. Yeah, so absolutely. let's see. Um, I think we've got the picture there. There we go. So if you aren't already yeah, following Julian on Instagram, uh, the disabled hippie, which is such a fantastic username, by the way. Um, Thank you. And, and you've got your experiences and stories up there as well. So definitely, definitely give Julian a follow to learn more about his experiences there and what he's been, uh, what what you've been up to. I did want to talk really quick here. I know we're running a little bit long, but um, I want to talk a little bit about your work with We Speak Models. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really curious what it's like working with an organization that's explicitly accepting of models of all backgrounds and ability. Yeah, um, so I work with a couple agencies. The other ones that I work with uh, are just for people with disabilities. Um, and that's definitely a unique experience, but as I kind of grow into modeling, I, I'm really starting to enjoy um, these diverse modeling agencies where, like you said, they kind of cover all people from all different backgrounds because sometimes when it, it gets too specific, it can come off as like uh, tokenism and, you know, I'm sure uh, you know what I mean by that. So it can be a tricky a thing to run around, but... Um, I mean, I, I love it and I love, you know, the work and, that I get to do and the people that I get to meet because I get to work with uh, people that are, are like me and um, also people different from me. But um, when I first started modeling, I was exposed to a lot of uh, like traditional modeling or kind of around people that made me feel a little bit nervous or inferior or kind of like would be like oh you're like you're here um so it's nice to finally be around inclusive people <laughs> absolutely what has been your favorite experience on stage so far um well for that brooklyn show in particular the tomboy one um or any show i've ever done i love how excited people get when i come out because um usually i'm uh the only I'm either like the only person in a wheelchair there or one of the only people so they get really excited like when they see me um it's just really special and it's there's nothing like going out there and being in the lights like that and there's like a, a ton of people it's very um thrilling and exciting I know that we're all living in this COVID world right now but uh, mm -hmm. what are your hopes for the next year what what do you hope to accomplish and what do you have that you're working on right now that you can share with us? Yeah, well, I'm finally uh, relocating back to like the New York, Philly, you know, tri-state area. Um, I've been back and forth between there for a couple of years now. So I'm excited to finally settle down there um, because I think when I'm there, uh, you know, coronavirus permitting, um, I think I'll be able to do a lot more stuff in person, which is what I've been really wanting to do. I've been on the internet for a while and now I'm like, I want to keep doing these, you know, exciting and thrilling in person stuff. So I'm excited to see what opportunities are up there for me. Now, I can't wait to see what you are able to find up there. I can't wait for all of us to be able to actually spend time with each other in person again. It's been just ah, the strangest year, but uh, better safe than sorry and better safer for all of our sakes right yeah absolutely all right we do have some viewer questions i wanted to get to as well so if you're watching live right now on youtube facebook or twitch and you have a question for julian or myself feel free to put those in the chat we'll get to as many as we can uh, but we are going to start with the questions that were submitted through instagram earlier this week and the first question we have here is do you have any advice for other trans people looking to start modeling yeah um well 
you can have, you could, you know, start with an agency. You don't have to have an agency necessarily. I know quite a few people who um, are their own manager, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you do want to look into an agency, I would, I would start by just typing in inclusive modeling agencies. Um, there's a ton in New York, a ton in LA, and you don't have to live in those areas to be um, signed with those people. Uh, when I was starting out, I had a friend that had a fancy camera take my digitals. Um, you just want to have a plain white or black background and a uh, white or black shirt and jeans. And uh, if you look on, uh, if you search it up like digitals for models, it'll tell you all the different like angles that you want to take them at. Um, I would just start doing it. You know, it. People think it's expensive, but it doesn't have to be. You can you can do it yourself or get your friend to do it. Uh, they want untouched photos of you, um, looking natural. So it's definitely a doable thing. All right, our next question here: How did you find the confidence to model? Well, uh, I did modeling when I was younger, so I did it when I presented um, and lived as as you know as female. Um, but it didn't it didn't feel right. I loved the idea of it, but it didn't feel right. Um, but I don't know. I've always kind of been like a little performer. Like I used to put on shows for my parents, like to Backstreet Boys or uh, dress up and like dance around. So. Um, I don't know. It's always kind of been in me. And then I think when I finally started to look like how I wanted to look, I just kind of was like, okay, I can do this. Um, and I saw other people on Instagram that were disabled or trans doing it. And I was like, wow, okay, this is possible. And I started to look for an agency. And then I just booked a ticket to New York um, to go to a casting, like on a whim. It was a crazy, <laughs> just on a whim thing that I did and I made my friend go with me and <laughs> it worked out. So it was really cool. That's awesome. And I mean, you are such a natural too. Um, and again, if you're not already following Julian on Instagram, you have to go look at some of his shots because you just own it. You own every <laughs> photo shoot and it is so amazing to see you um, either on stage or doing some of your other modeling work. It's, it's incredible. And I'd love to see your confidence out there. Thank you. It's a fun job. It's the most fun job. <laughs> I'm very blessed right. to be doing things I love. Absolutely. All right. I think we've got one final question here, unless anything else pops into the user chat. But let's go to the last one. And it is, how do you deal with community infighting? And I guess that can be looked at from from either a, a trans standpoint or a, a disability standpoint yeah so kind of what we touched on in the beginning about yeah. um sometimes in our own community yeah well it i mean it's no secret it happens in the trans community it also happens in the disability community you get a lot of people who um call each other like fakers and whatever and it's it's very you know it can be malicious um I think it happens in every every community that exists and I think particularly it happens in marginalized communities because there's kind of like uh, people can be very protective of their identities or they're used to having to fight for something so they can it can translate right and we have internalized transphobia we have internalized ableism um, so whenever I have an issue with someone I, I try to see it from that perspective um, I went to school for psychology, so I'm always trying to be patient and, like, understand people. I, I just can't help it. I'm always doing that. So um, whenever that happens, I'm just like, it's probably, you know, something that they're fighting with and dealing with, and you know, they're projecting it. it. It's probably not about me. Um, I always try to offer my support or try to be nice to someone, even if they're they're rude to me. I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but that's what I do, and... Uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then I walk away because, you know, I tried and that's that. And they may not be open to hearing it at the time, but sometimes they are. So, yeah, but I'm sure other people deal with it, you know, in their own way. So. Very true. And I think that's a great answer. You know, it's 
a lot of times more than just what's visible on the surface, what people are going through. And uh, if you can really get to the root cause of it, I think most of the time we'll find that it's coming from a, a place of pain or, or discomfort from a reason maybe beyond what the initial issue was about. Yeah, well, because it's it's how we were raised. Like, I mean, I was raised in the lens of an able-bodied person. I was raised in the lens of um, I was supposed to be, you know, cis and, and female. Um, so we have all these societal things about us and over time you have to break them down and work through them and s some people take longer to do that or they might not realize it yet so i think that's a great answer and that's that's the last question i had for you so we, we actually made okay. it through without any Yay. major issues here this is our first episode <laughs> in like three episodes where we didn't have the audio trap out or something give out so that's good <laughs> I tried to stay very but, still. <laughs> that's it. Jillian, thank you so much for your time here and answering all these questions and sharing a bit of your story and your, your journey. I think it's so important that we share as much as we can about as many journeys as possible. And I really appreciate the work you're doing, sharing your journey through transition, as well as your work supporting and advocating for the disabled and uh, the disabled community. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It was nice to finally talk to you in person. <laughs> kind yeah. of. Yeah, here, kind hang tight. <laughs> it, it has been nice. Um, it's, it's a long time coming, so I'm glad we had this chance here. Uh, I do want to take a moment really quick to talk about our next episode. So we are going to be live again in two weeks with guest Andrea James. So Andrea created TS Roadmap in 1996, which is one of the very first all-inclusive websites aimed at supporting the transgender community online. She's been a tireless transgender advocate, producer, and writer over her career, providing pieces to the Huffington Post and Boeing Boeing, among many others, and working on productions such as Transamerica and Transamerican Love Story. So we're hoping that you'll join us here in two weeks on August 20th, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And as always, if you're not already following us over on YouTube at Trans IRL, please subscribe over there. You can catch our past episodes. We're on Facebook at Trans IRL Show and Instagram at Trans IRL. So don't forget to like and follow us over there as well. And as a reminder, on Instagram, you can submit questions for our guests prior to the show. And if you are on Twitch, we are broadcasting on Trans IRL. And the Trans Ventures show starts in about an hour. So you can watch them right after us. So let's bring everyone back on here really quick. Jillian, thank you once again for your time here tonight. Really wonderful having this chance to talk to you. And uh, I hope it's not too long before it's actually safe to travel and we can meet up up there in the uh, Northeast. Oh, yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. And Stephen, thank you again for keeping things running in the background there. And congrats again on your anniversary. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone uh, joining us on the chat this evening. Yeah, there was some great people, great conversation happening over there in the chat. Always like to see that and appreciate it. And as always, it's great to have everyone watching. So from all of us here at Trans IRL, thanks again for tuning in. We will see you here in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.